Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Apologies for the slightly late start. Um, today we're talking about hot topics in sexual health. Uh, my name is Becky Burbage. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive of FPA, uh, and I'm here with Karen Sullivan, our clinical consultant. Um, and this webinar is part of our SexWise program. If you've been to the webinars before, you'll know all about that. Uh, just in case you're new to us, uh, SexWise is our program funded by Public Health England. It's a national resource given about contraception, pregnancy, TIs, and uh, sexual pleasure and well-being. Um, uh, our website, sexwise.org.uk, that has more information about the program, and it's a resource for patients as well as information for, uh, and for professionals. So very before I hand you over to Karen, I'm just going to let you know what we're going to be doing today. Um, so we'll be talking about the new combined hormone contraception that was released by SSRH um, earlier earlier this year, uh, which kind of hit the head quite a lot. Uh, we'll also be talking about um, revised STI guidelines, uh, really important as um, such a lot of uh, we see much more antibiotic resistance. Um, you may not be aware that new guidelines have been issued you know, to be uh, just what those are. We'll Talking about HIV and exposure, uh, prophylactics. I'm going to leave that one to come. Uh, and we're going to be talking um, uh, sexual, uh, lesbian, bisexual, and trans women because you may or may not be a bisexual and trans sexual health week. So, if you're with me, I'm just going to keep, uh, pass you over to, uh, and we'll we'll get that. Hi, so back in January, it seemed that long ago, uh, Secretary of Sexual and Reproductive Health new guidance around combined hormonal contraception. And we have talked about it, um, but I, I think um, it's really important that uh, um, we can do this new way of patch and rear. Uh, what the faculty guidance in 2012 um, was that uh, there were all themes um, but we've really come out a reason to have a seven day break there are alternative regimes that we could um, offer women and be much better in it's really not necessary period you want to hopefully you've seen some of it in the press um, uh, um, Anyway, moving. so we've brought out our new leaflets that should be available to order very uh, changing the leaflets to look at alternative regimes. So we've, we've got try, we've got continual use, we've got flexible use. We've got the same for the patch, again, new regimes. Uh, these are available on an FPA. Uh, so the leaflets will be able to order and um, very soon. And we've got typical use, continuous or flexible extend. The important thing to look at all three of these, the combined ring, is to really note the um, of the hormone free interval and days. Days. This is going to make positive for women that are going to forget um, uh, around the hormone-free interval because it's going to that. So we've got that uh, in the leaflets, and this is taken from the faculty guide. The vaginal ring uh, got for you. Days five or seven days. Reduce cycling where you would. Um, uh, so do have a look. At the importance to use is that you are going to have some bleeding. Breakthrough bleeding is 
then we can look at views. So if I'm exceptional to four and remove a few combined pill and just uh, instead of a seven day break. So they got missed or or patch or ring really detail but just showing you with it okay I'm told that we're getting so we're just gonna see if we can just bear with us. All right, we're just fiddling with our sound settings here um, to see if we can uh, be heard a little bit more by you so that Karen can um I not lost apologies for this. Um, uh, I'm just, yeah. Uh, we've just had a sort of fiddle with the settings here. Um, so I'm going to hand you back to Karen uh, just to talk. And this is what the new hormonal contraception guide looks for usage. So we have got charts, the flow charts that everybody loves in different colours, um, so that you can go through that. So it is to underline, draw information, um, uh, to really be aware that, that that information is there, and this is the bit that people need to look at. And again, We've also got that uh, incorrect use of the of the ring, um, and it's looking at uh, all the guidance down and doing it with patients every single time that they come. So moving on to other hot topics, There's chlamydia treatment guidance. Um, so bash back in November, and the really important thing to point. Out longer a, a one-off um, stat dose of azithromycin um, but the course of antibiotics now needs to be for longer so first choice uh, is going to be doxycycline for seven days and alternative treatments um, so if somebody couldn't use doxycycline um, we might be looking at a, a, a course of azithromycin for three days um, or if there was rectal chlamydia then we'd be looking for a, a longer course so it's really important to, to check with the BASH guidance, the British Association of Sexual Health and HIV, just to um, so we do sometimes start um, treatment before we've got the results of tests back. So on suspicion of people having uh, a chlamydial infection, and it's really important. This is a sexually transmitted infection. So we do partner notification and make sure that we treat partners um, as well. So test and treat partners as well. It's very effective if taken. So uh, it's really um, good to 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 and advice for patients: how long till they can have sex again? So it's important to avoid anal sex using sex toys until all partners have completed treatment and with the short course so azithromycin in the three-day course it's really uh, to stress that that avoiding sex is for seven days after um, so that's how long azithromycin takes to work so the course of treatment uh, for it to work is going to be seven days so that's why they need to avoid sex for seven days No up test unless the patient thinks they may have come into contact with chlamydia again. They had unprotected sex with a partner before treatment for both was finished. They didn't complete the treatment, signs and symptoms don't go away, or the test was initially negative but they developed signs or symptoms of chlamydia. So um, it, it's important avoiding sex and, 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 and what information we need to take them to take away so that we can uh, uh, advise them to come back if they need to. 
and we've got our new furry tails uh, so we have got uh, Ali the uh, koala who's talking to a practitioner there about uh, his uh, chlamydia diagnosis and treatment so please have a look at our furry tails video um, signposted easily on the SexWise website so if you click on the left hand side there's three little bars takes you down to professionals and in the professionals our previous webinars are available and our furry tales videos these can also be um, put um, so very popular with young people uh, so please afterwards this brings us on to the revised BASH, the British Association of Sexual Health and HIV have brought out new guidance and this is uh, strongly to do with the antibiotic resistance or the antimicrobial resistance uh, we've had some cases of multi-drug resistant gonorrhea in the UK so uh, BASH has looked at the, uh, the uh, treatment guidelines and this has just been published Again, our gonorrhea leaflet um, uh, is in the process of going through our peer review um, system, so that will be available shortly. But uh, BASH have now recommended that we go to monotherapy rather than dual therapy, and this is injection by cefetraxone, unless patients can't have that. So um, there are alternatives in the BASH guidance. Again, we can start the treatment straight away, but due to the antimicrobial resistance, it's really important to take a culture before treatment is started, and this is to check that we've got the right antibiotics um, uh, and they're going to treat the... So a test of cure must be taken afterwards. We want to make sure that it was the right antibiotics and that the um, infection has gone away. And treatment has changed on partners so before we would always treat all partners now we need to be looking at if when they attend so if partners come within two weeks of that initial diagnosis they will be treated with the same as their index case um, if it's longer than two weeks then we need to be looking at testing that person first um, what's of that um, test before we start treatment but again really important to take culture swabs um, so we can check it's the right antibiotics and again avoid vaginal anal and oral sex until all partners have been um, tested and treated so moving on to HIV PrEP uh, and PEP so PrEP pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, PrEP, when used consistently by people at risk of HIV, is really effective at preventing HIV acquisition. PrEP is currently being trialled in the UK. There's 26,000 places available to people who are considered high risk or meet um, all other criteria. If a patient asks about PrEP, it could be helpful to work out why they think they might need it. Um, and it is only uh, available for free in the UK on the IMPACT trial, but can also be bought online or at private clinics. And websites such as PrEPster are good sources of information to signpost people to. Um, it's just talking about uh, more uh, high risk groups that uh, I've mentioned there so if we're looking at um, risk behavior people at risk include men who have sex with men uh, people who don't um, and don't know the HIV status of those that they have sex with sex workers uh, people who have um, risky um, uh, activities such as chem sex and PrEP uh, has come into some criticism um, from some people, but it's similar. I, I liken it to uh, needle exchange programs. So sometimes people in life are going through difficult times or risky times in their life, um, so activities which will put them more at risk. Uh, and that's the needle exchange programs, PrEP, etc. Uh, is about taking people past that risky behavior um, so uh, so that, so that 
later on in life or behaviors change people are no longer at risk so it's not needed but it's really effective in preventing um, HIV acquisition so it's something that, that we should be talking about with patients and it is in our um, FPA HIV uh, leaflet uh, which we've looked there and on the SexWise website we've got information about HIV so looking at PEP post-exposure prophylaxis if someone thinks they might have been exposed to HIV taking PEP can reduce chances of infection and PEP involves starting a course of HIV treatment within three days of exposure um, to HIV or uh, at-risk uh, sexual intercourse and the more quickly PEP is taken the more effective it's likely to be so it's a bit like emergency contraception but in terms of for HIV rather than for pregnancy so PEP is usually only given to people who've had unprotected vaginal or anal sex with someone who's HIV positive, um, who's not taking treatment, or if the virus is currently detectable in their blood. Um, so it may also be given to people, again, if they're not aware of the partner's HIV status um, or other situations such as sexual assault. And you can get PEP from sexual health services or A&E, but it's really important to stress um, that it should be within um, 72 hours of the sex that people are concerned about. We've got here an update um, on HIV. Um, so from, from UN AIDS, um, we're looking at 90, 90, 90 goals. Um, and we're doing particularly well with this in the UK, um, is that we're meeting all of those. So 92% of people in the UK who are living with HIV are diagnosed. 98% of those people are on effective antiretroviral treatment. And therefore, 97% of those people are virally um, suppressed. And that's really important. That's really good news um, for uh, HIV. Um, so in the UK, what we are still, or worldwide, what we're still concerned about is that late diagnoses rates um, do remain high. So when we look at the 92% of people living with HIV are diagnosed, that's leaving us with 8% of people who are living with HIV who are undiagnosed. Um, so late diagnosis rates remain high um, at around 40% over the last five years. Um, and in 2017, 43% of people were diagnosed late. And, and the late diagnoses are highest in heterosexual uh, men and women. So we need to be targeting testing people because the really good news is that once you're on effective treatment, U equals U. If you have an undetectable viral load, there's body, uh, and uh, that means that if people have an undetectable viral load for at least six months and continue to take treatment, there is no risk of transmitting HIV during sex. So undetectable equals untransmittable. And this is really good news. Um, as we're exceeding those 90-90-90 targets. So 98% of people are on treatment and are virally suppressed. So U equals U means that we're really making a difference uh, in um, uh, tackling HIV worldwide. And we can be really proud of that in the UK. But what we've got to think about is the groups of people that um, we haven't uh, that are not diagnosed, that are still living with HIV and don't know it. Um, so, so there's still some work to be done, but we're doing pretty well. So the final thing that we're going to talk about uh, today is Lesbian, Bisexual and Trans Women's Health Week. Um, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, something to think about. Sometimes professionals will make assumptions about health needs based on sexuality. And there are some health issues which affect LB and T women disproportionately. So it's really useful to get in touch with our sexual history taking. We've done a webinar before on sexual history taking, so go back and have a look at that um, uh, if, it's, uh, um, if, if you would like some more information on that. Um, but it's really uh, useful. We should be asking patients about the types of sex they're having. 
And don't assume, don't make assumptions that people currently have a same-sex partner or that if they um, don't currently or that they haven't ever had sex with men because people will have. So lesbian, bisexual women who have sex with women have a significantly higher rate of pregnancy than adolescent heterosexual women. And the reasons for this are complex and not fully understood, um, but the relationships and sex education, um, if we are only talking about relationships and sex education in a, a, a heterosexual a group of people, um, they think this information is not going to apply to them. So we need to make it more inclusive. Um, so uh, do have a think about um, keeping uh, lesbian, bisexual women who have sex with women um, engaged in their reproductive health so that they do realise that, that, that it is important uh, to know about contraception, um, to prevent pregnancy, other sexual health needs. People who were assigned, so trans and non-binary sexual health care, people who were assigned female at birth but no longer identify as female may still have contraceptive needs. Um, and obviously where hormone treatment is involved, things get a bit complicated, but the non-hormonal copper IUDs are safe to use, don't interfere with hormone regimes. Uh, there is FS Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health guidance uh, available for more details on other um, hormonal contraception. And it's really helpful, it's really good. Uh, reference that we've, we've put towards the end of the presentations. So it's important that uh, trans and non-binary people, um, we, we consider the need for emergency hormonal contraception if they don't wish to become pregnant um, uh, and to think about uh, using contraception uh, if, they are, if there is a risk of pregnancy and partners don't want to conceive. But as I've said, the faculty document will be much, uh, it has some really good information in it. Other sexual health care, um, non-binary people who have a uterus should be told about the National Cervical Screening Program. So really trans and non-binary patients to understand their sexual behaviours, uh, to understand whether they need contraception, uh, and when high risk activities are identified, work with them to understand the importance of safer sex and the availability of both PrEP and PEP. Okay, so I'm just going to hand back to Becky now. Hi, thanks, Helen, for that. So there's a chance now to, um, for you to ask questions. Um, so if you bear with us a moment, there should just be. Um, a little uh, question thing popping up on your your screen there. And if you've got any questions for us, um, we're now we've got a few minutes left where we can take questions. Um, if you uh, think of a burning question afterwards, then feel free to email it to us uh, at sexwise at fpa.org.uk. We're happy to take questions afterwards as well. Um, if you have yeah, if you have any questions at the moment, then um, do send those through to us. Uh, nothing coming through at the moment. So we'll just carry on. Um, oops. Uh, just to let you know that we've got uh, references uh, at the end of the slides. We will be sending these slides around uh, to everyone as well who's registered for the webinar, just so that you can um, so you can pick up on anything that you want to kind of take forward. Um, so yeah, we don't we don't seem to have any questions. Um, possibly we were just very clear on the webinar, or possibly the uh, question thing is broken. Hard, <laughs> always hard to say. Um, yeah, no, nothing coming through. Okay, if um, if anyone does think of anything, then uh, obviously just uh, oh no, hold on, we've got some stuff coming through now. Um, so bear in mind, the first one is that the slides reference LBT week. Is there a specific week? Yes, there is, and it's this week. Um, I'm not sure if we've got that in the references or not, but if you if you Google um, lesbian, bisexual, and trans women's health week, um, then 
the website for that should come up. Um, and I know they're doing sort of various activities throughout the week. Um, so do you Google that and have a look at all the information. Um, and then we've got a question on gonorrhea as well. So I'm going to just hand over to Karen for that quickly and then we'll have to wrap up. So the question was, if you're seeing an asymptomatic patient who's a contact of gonorrhea after two weeks, so I did say that it's important that the BASH guidance has changed. So you treat contacts if they attend within the first two weeks um, of, of the initial patient contact. Um, so if we're seeing asymptomatic patient, we would probably then wait until the results of their test were back. Um, but it's very important if you're going to initiate treatment, um, then you would have to do a culture first. So the, I think the answer to the question is asymptomatic patient after two weeks, we would do the NATS test before we started treatment. Um, but go to the to the BASH gonorrhea guidance because it has changed um, and it does lay it out quite nicely in there. Close now. Yeah, that's it from us um, for today. Thank you so much for attending. Um, if you did have any sound issues, apologies for that. Um, I heard it was good for some people, but patchy for others, I think, depending how you're accessing it. Um, so I hope you're able to hear us say we will send around the slides and the recording so that you can go back and check everything. Um, the has got a couple of courses coming up that may be of interest, sexual and reproductive health for practice nurses and young people, sexuality in the digital world. All the information and booking is online at the FPA website, so fpa.org.uk forward slash training. Um, don't forget to visit the SexWise website as well and register for those already. Um, so that's all from us for today. Thank you so much. We'll um, also send you around certificates of attendance. Um, and when I close the event in a moment, you'll get a little thing popping up asking to give you give feedback so that we can um, improve in future. And also, we welcome any suggestions for future webinars um, for the next year shortly. Uh, so thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.